familiar with you all, but if not, let me tell you a few things about him. Um, he is our executive director for We Care, and We Care stands for the work group enhancing community advocacy, research, and education. And he has led a group and team of us um, in this not only battle against COVID, but other areas as it relates to community-based participatory research um, now for collectively almost 10 years or more. Uh, we have other members of our group here today, Dr. Deborah Austin from Reach Up, who represents our primary community partner. And we have Mr. Hiram Green, who is our community relations contact for the College of Pharmacy. Um, so they are here today and I'd like to have them wave to, to everyone also. So it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'd like to thank you all again for allowing us to come and share a little bit more information um, as we're trying to all survive, adapt, and just to the pandemic and what it's, it's caused um, in terms of our, our lives as, as we know it now. So let me tell you a little bit more, remind you a few things about Dr. Sneed. As I mentioned, he is the founding dean for the Tunisia College of Pharmacy. He's a tenured professor and also serves as the senior associate vice president for USF Health. He actually has a bachelor's degree with a uh, minor in and a concentration in microbiology from the University of Central Florida and received his doctor of pharmacy degree from Xavier University. He's provided all kinds of uh, pharmacy services as well as community service to the Tampa Bay community for over 20 plus years, uh, serving uh, in the capacity of, of a professor at, at both University of South Florida and Florida a and University. He's well respected uh, both as a clinician, uh, as a leader, and certainly as a community advocate. And we're just so proud to be a part of his team as we try to close the health spare dis uh, the health disparities um, that exist, particularly in diverse communities. And so this is one of probably about 35 or, or 40 workshops and, and town halls and, and radio interviews and, and other kinds of formats that we've done just in light of the, the pandemic. And so we hope um, that you will not only be entertained, but enlightened and empowered and motivated after you hear from him today. He uh, again serves on so many community boards Boards and is, is very active in different kinds of organizations and very knowledgeable, very intelligent. And it's an honor to serve with him and to serve um, certainly under his leadership. So with that, I'll let him come to you in his own way to talk to you about the COVID uh, vaccine. Dr. Sneed. Uh, Dr. Hill, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And, and I, I think you said the key word, number one, the partnership that we've had with Reach Up. Uh, has really been been a godsend for many of us here in the community, uh, especially me and, and all of us here at We Care. Uh, that relationship has been ongoing for over a two year period. And, and uh, many of you may recall several years ago, we were actually at the Children's Board uh, with a community advocacy matchmaking event. And uh, it went very well. And, and I've come down there on, on multiple occasions over the years to, uh, to talk with many of you. Uh, I think back in December, I think we, you know, we gave you all uh, a, a fairly comprehensive uh, presentation at time just about COVID, uh, a little bit about how it works. So I thought today would be very good. And what and what's beginning to happen now is that um, uh, after about a, a three or four month period, uh, people are now having very very specific questions that they want answered. And and uh, I participated in a a, uh, a town hall last evening. Uh, with our Florida Legislative uh, Black Caucus, and and the questions were were quite good, and I'm sure you all have very good questions. And so, rather than go through uh, the full presentation we had before, um, I'm just going to do a couple of things here uh, to to kind of uh, have a quick primer on um, on some of the information around the vaccines. Number one, and then number two, uh, I really hope that we can dialogue and get your questions answered uh, because we're at a critical stage right now in terms of the overall um, battle against the virus. And I'm gonna share some information with you all uh, very shortly. So let me, let, me just, um, let me just get this queued up. And again, this is gonna be very, very brief. Uh, it, it will be extremely brief uh, because I really want, now we need to have a dialogue to, to uh, uh, if there's anyone wavering or anyone, anything you've heard in the news, uh, we can address that for, for all of you. 
So uh, just give me one quick second here and we can get, the, get everything queued up. Okay, here we go. Share sound. So I'm going to show this video to you all again, just one more time to reacclimate everyone to this particular virus. Uh, there are mutations and, and variants that we're hearing about in the news, and I'm very, uh, I'll be very um, happy to try and address uh, uh, the questions about that. But let's just start here for a moment, just to help everybody understand what, what we're trying to accomplish. In a world where millions of lives are under threat due to COVID-19, it is of vital importance to gain a better understanding of how the virus actually works in search of a cure. The surface of the virus particle is covered with approximately 100 spike proteins. They always come in groups of three, in which the proteins are intertwined. Each individual protein consists of two parts, a globular head called S1 and a stalk-like structure called S2. One of the three heads is slightly bent, enabling it to connect to the so-called ACE2 receptor on a human cell. Once the connection between the virus and the receptor has been established, the human body activates the TMPRSS2 enzyme. This is a protein-cutting enzyme that proceeds to cut off the head of the spike protein. This causes a change in the structure of the virus. The S2 protein now grows longer, penetrating the human cell. The protein then retracts again, bringing the membranes of the virus and the cell very close to one another. At this point, the virus can enter the cell through a process of endocytosis. It engulfs the cell with its membrane. The virus has successfully invaded the cell and can now start to multiply, ready to overrun the system. However, we have strong defence mechanisms that try to prevent this from happening at all costs. Scientists recently discovered how our antibodies react. It's actually a very simple process. Our antibodies bind to the spike head, or S1, thereby preventing it from connecting with the ACE2 receptor and stopping the virus from spreading. Understanding exactly how this process takes place is key to the rapid development of a vaccine, making it an essential part of our ongoing fight against this global public health crisis. So it's very important to understand one of the key things that you all heard in that, in this, uh, that, that brief video that we've, we've shown many times now it's the fact that that spike protein really does have three different components to it, what we call uh, three spike heads. And some of, the, thing, some of the, thing, the things that are happening now in terms of the mutations really are kind of focused on uh, those three spike heads. And so I'll be happy to answer any questions about what we're hearing in the news, uh, but I just wanted to kind of use that to kind of uh, spark a little bit of a thought from all of you. Uh, now, as you, many of you are aware, we have two uh, vaccines that are currently and presently on the market. Um, uh, they, they are still under emergency use authorization. They have not gained 100% full approval. Uh, they are the Moderna product and the product from, um, uh, from BioNTech and Pfizer. And we expect that probably within a, about a 10 day period that the uh, Johnson & Johnson will very likely uh, seek approval for their product and we'll share more of the differences on between those, uh, all of those. Uh, it's really important to also understand that these have been well studied. Uh, you can see about 30,000 people were studied with Moderna, about 45,000 people with the Pfizer product, and also um, there's another 30,000 in J the Janssen and Janssen product. Now, people are asking about the vaccines and, and um, how were they studied and who were, who were in the studies, and it's very important to understand that these are some of the most studied vaccines that we've ever had um, uh, come out, especially because of the pandemic. Uh, most importantly, we almost achieved about 10% um, African Americans, and there were over 20% in both the Moderna and Pfizer product for those of Hispari uh, Hispanic um, background and descent. Uh, people are really concerned about the, the um, side effects, and 
And so both for the Moderna product and the Pfizer product, um, these are the percentages of people. And it's really important to understand what that means. It doesn't mean that it's going to be automatic that if you go and get the vaccine that you're going to get any of the um, adverse reactions you're, you're showing that are being shown here. And so again, the most common thing between both of them has been fatigue. Uh, you know, fatigue after the first shot for both of them. Uh, people feel a little bit tired the following day. And then behind that uh, has been headache. And these are very normal. Also, uh, keep in mind that when you begin to have these side effects, it's not that you've been injected with anything from the virus. It's actually your body uh, drawing resources from you to ramp up and manufacture the antibodies that we need to create the antibody army in your body. Uh, a smaller number of people uh, do experience fever and chills as well. Uh, but the, again, um, simply taking Tylenol in all of the clinical trials, and I can tell you from personal use, I've had the vaccine both uh, shot one and shot two, uh, taking Tylenol uh, typically will curb many of these effects. There are no preservatives in either one of these vaccines, and it's very important to understand that as well. And uh, as far as the messenger RNA technology, just want to make sure everybody, again, has a very clear understanding of how these things work. Uh-oh. We are up. Apologies for that. Uh, uh, my 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 uh, my PowerPoint stopped, but that's okay because I, I was gonna. I was really just gonna say that that um, what is being injected into your body is what we call messenger RNA. It's like almost like a computer code, telling your body what it wants it to do, and then once we inject that, and it it tells your body what to make from your own proteins that messenger RNA is gone. It doesn't hang around. It's, it's gone within about a 24 hour period. And so people are really wondering, well, what can it do to me long-term? What, what are the long-term side effects? Well, to be perfectly honest, uh, there's no way, that, there's no way with, uh, definitively just being very transparent that we're gonna know. Um, but we do know from years and years of, of historical content that most side effects, if they're going to occur, will occur within about a 60 day period. And so when you go to the FDA to get approval, they, uh, they review data for a two month period following the last person reviewed by that committee. And I can tell you that even now that we've given millions and millions of uh, injections here in this country and around the world, um, beginning back in May with the phase one clinical trials, uh, we're, we're, we're still witnessing a fairly, a very safe overall vaccine process. So I'm gonna pause right there uh, Dr. Hill, uh, I want to get into a Q&A with many of our people here and get, you know, get let's answer some questions that people have about, um, about the vaccines uh, specifically. And, uh, and I'll do the best I can to transparently and openly and honestly with good evidence uh, answer your questions. Okay, so there's the invitation, everyone, if you don't mind, um, putting your questions in the chat and uh, <coughs> me and Mr. Brown and Dr. Austin will make sure that we uh, read them out. And Dr. Hill, while we're waiting for people to kind of get their questions and put into the chat, or even I, I invite you to, uh, you, you can even turn your camera on and we can have a dialogue about it. But um, I'd like to remind people as well that even over the past one month, uh, so much information on, just on the nature and the cellular nature of what this virus, uh, what it is, what it does to you, um, some of the changes. Uh, I read all of that and uh, we are learning more and more every day. There has never been a more studied virus probably in such a short amount of time than, than what we have right now. There are literally hundreds of thousands of publications out there around the world about this coronavirus and, and the effect of the pandemic. And that really does show the power of the scientific community. So, um, uh, so let, yeah, let's, yeah let's, let's get started here. So Ms. Paula Scott was wondering how concerned you are about the new variants. Um, that, that, no, that's a very good question. And sure, surely where we probably wanna start because we're hearing so much in the news right now. Uh, there's a two part answer for that. Number one, uh, we have to be very clear. Everything that we currently know, the, the new variants, the, the new variants are, are not more deadly uh, than, than the original, what we're going to refer to as the wild type or the original version of this COVID-19 virus. Uh, what they have learned to do, and that's why we're going to have a very good conversation about the vaccination process and why we need to continue wearing a mask. What the variants are now learning to do is to attach better. So when in that video, the reason I showed the video again, when you have that red spike protein and there are three parts of it, 
the mutations are beginning to occur in that spike protein and it's learning more about the human body, about how to attach more efficiently and gain entry into our cells more efficiently and then turn around and, and, um, and reproduce more quickly, which is why you're hearing more about this transmissibility or is much more transmissible between people right now. Um, now there is one variant that is causing a little bit more concern uh, uh, from South Africa. And that particular vi uh, variant, uh, it, it does appear that maybe the mutation, the mutated um, head uh, is now um, uh, turning into something other than what the current vaccines were clearly 100% uh, targeted to do. However, the, vac the vaccines that are on the market, both Moderna, Pfizer, Janssen and Janssen, and, um, and, there, and, and others, they actually produce what we call polyclonal antibodies. So uh, your antibodies are actually being attached onto the three heads and we have a, a variant for each one. So you're still getting protection. So we don't want people to think that, okay, there's a mutation occurring and if I get the vaccine, it's not going to work. Yes, it will work, uh, but it just may not work at the, the same 100% capacity that we anticipated. Uh, but at this current moment, what I'm really more concerned about is that if we have a more transmissible virus, it will continue to spread to more people. We could have a third surge. And therefore, we have to continue wearing a mask. We have to continue social distancing. And we need to make every attempt we can. And I know it's very difficult right now, but very, make every attempt we can to try and uh, get as many people vaccinated as possible. So thank you for that. OK. Well, Mr. Brown uh, asked a question about, you know, is one vaccine better than the other? Mm -hmm. uh, for the currently available vaccines, no. I, I would not say that one is better than the other at all. Um, it's just really a matter of how we store them. Uh, it's much harder to store the Pfizer product. We have to keep it at very cold temperatures on minus 80 degrees. Uh, the, the, the Moderna product you know, has to be stored at, at approximately um, really freezer temperature, your, your freezer at home, which is about zero degrees uh, Celsius. Um, but between, as far as the efficacy of one over the other, no, they're, they're pretty much identical. And I want to be very clear because other vaccines are going to come on the market. And now we've set such a high bar of hearing about a 95% effectiveness between Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, last, last year, we were only hoping to get to about 65 or 70 percent. If we, if we had gotten to 70 percent, we were going to be ecstatic. Now, overwhelmingly, even the flu vaccines we put out every year don't, even, don't come close to achieving that, and they protect the overwhelming number of people against the flu. And so if you hear about another vaccine coming down the road and you hear it's like 75 percent effective, that doesn't mean it's not good. It means it really is good. It's really great. But we just achieved something with the Moderna and Pfizer product that uh, uh, really scientifically was unexpected. But I would not say one is better than the other right now. Okay. Well, Ms. Christina Austin wanted to know if an individual has an autoimmune disorder, is there any specific vaccine that might be better suited for those kinds of individuals? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, the one, uh, I can't call it a fallacy, but for lack of a better word, I will kind of use it from a, from a late standpoint. Uh, it's the fact that we did not have many people in the clinical trials that had autoimmune disorders. And there's a whole array of uh, disorders that we have to really be concerned about from that standpoint. Also, many people that have these disorders are on, on immunosuppressant uh, medication. So um, you know, we, have, we, we don't know the full effect there, but now the recommendations coming out are, you know, we want people to get vaccinated. And again, the messenger RNA technology, I think is gonna be very effective for people with autoimmune disorders because um, in your body, in each one of us right now, we all have messenger RNA that is very active at this current moment. And it's probably somewhere on the order of about no less than a, a trillion um, interactions uh, and per, per millisecond. Uh, that's occurring in our bodies with the messenger RNA. So uh, we, you know, the recommendations are now that you know we want people to come out and get them. We are recommending that if you are on a specific treatment, uh, many people on lupus treatments, if you're getting an IV treatment, that we try and separate that out by about a two week period. Um, but right now, uh, the recommendation is uh, unless unless your individual physician has a
Dr. Sneed, you're muted. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what you all heard or didn't hear. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure why that happened. By the way, um, I, I didn't just touch. Go, I didn't touch anything here. Yeah, just just go back. But, to, yeah, but very yeah, but very quickly, uh, the recommendation is for people with autoimmune disorders to to get the vaccine. Uh, if you are receiving specific IV treatment, we want to separate that time period out for about a two week period. And it may not be a bad idea that after you receive your second vaccine to go back in and try and get an antibody uh, test to, to see how you have responded to that back uh, to the vaccines. Okay, great. The uh, next question from Annette Rivera is, is the vaccine effective for the new variants? I think you kind of already addressed yeah, that. Yeah, 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 as of right now, yes. Uh, we, we, uh, they're testing that right now and all of the evidence coming back is indicating that they are active against it. And again, the vaccines are producing multiple types of antibodies in your body. Mm -hmm. um, as, I, as you saw in the video, that red spike head has about three different components to it and your body is building uh, what we call polyclonal antibodies to be able to attack the various components of that spike head. And so uh, the mutations right now have not uh, mutated enough to, uh, to, to make the current vaccines ineffective. But that brings up a great point. Uh, and that was Ms. Rivera, uh, I think Ms. Rivera, uh, Annette Rivera. Uh, what, again, it wouldn't happen like in a week or a month but the, the beauty of the messenger RNA technology is that if for any reason we get a, mute, a, a particular mutant that the vaccines are not effective against, we can go right back into the laboratory and we can build and, and, and tailor a new vaccine to match up to that one, especially if it proves to be more deadly. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to keep in mind, we've been working on all of these technologies and you're gonna hear a new term uh, coming out shortly, and, and Dr. Uh, Hill and and Dr. Austin, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna hear me talking more and more about this probably in about a month. We've been talking about messenger RNA vaccines. Pretty soon, you're gonna hear more about adenovector uh, vaccines, but even they have been tailored uh, to to be very specific to uh, uh, to this particular virus. So. so um, you know, we have every confidence right now that, that the current vaccines are going to be effective. Okay, um, Mr. Brown and, and Dr. Austin, you can jump in as well if you'd like, but one more question. Uh, Jennifer Whittington wanted to know what phase are we in regarding rolling it out? Are we still in phase one for first responders? As I mentioned before, I was on I was on a uh, a call last evening, and then we had kind of a, a second session directly with our elected officials here in, in Florida. Um, the the phased approach that we were trying to uh, get into and that had been recommended has really gone by the wayside. Um, uh, I can't tell you what phase we're in right now um, because almost immediately, many people around the country kind of modified and made their own phases. Uh, even here in the state of Florida. Uh, the recommendation to quickly jump to uh, those who are 65 and above and kind of put them kind of in, in the front of the line almost, um, that, that was not the direct phased approach uh, that, that was uh, recommended initially. Uh, but it's hard to argue against doing that because um, as I told our group last evening, uh, in a given population, when you make up 9% of the population being affected, but you're 40% of the deaths, uh, then you, you're going to attack the biggest problem that has the biggest impact. And so I can't, um, I, I can't dispute what the governor did with that. And more states around the country actually picked it up. So uh, the only thing I can tell you right now is that people that have uh, very significant chronic conditions, um, you know, can be recommended by their physician to get the vaccine when it's available. Uh, of course, 65 and above first responders. And uh, myself and other people, we are strongly advocating uh, for essential workers to be quickly added into that. And at the top of that line, I, uh, we have school teachers uh, that we would like added into that. Uh, we're, we're strongly advocating for that. And the biggest problem we have right now is, is just, we don't have enough product to give every, everybody that has demand for it. And so um, hopefully with more product coming in from Moderna and Pfizer, and then another uh, uh, vaccine being approved, hopefully we can get to more people. Dr. Sneed, I'll, I'll 
get to let you catch your breath, Angela, uh, Dr. Hill. Uh, but Dr. Sneed, really a pleasure to see you again. And yes, uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, another uh, question as we talk about this rollout and things, uh, are we getting any lessons learned? Because uh, this question is, do we, are we going to get this vaccine administered annually uh, from, from Ms. McGrown? And if this is going to be the annual rollout, I mean, we, we're going to have to figure something more effective out, I think. Yeah, Ms. Negron, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, the, 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 the very transparent answer is we don't know all the way. And what I can share with you is that right now we do think that the current vaccine may last about, about a two-year, I mean, about a two-year period. And so, um, but, what, but we don't have any proof of that because we haven't had it for two years, but, but uh, all indicators are that they are going to be enduring. However, we may need to do like we do with the annual flu vaccine and try to tweak the vaccine to match up to what is happening with any mutations or any variants that may be coming out annually. And we can also anticipate that the, uh, that the coronavirus is going to continue to um, be prevalent. Even if we got to the quote unquote herd immunity, um, uh, you know, we, we, we do anticipate that it's still gonna be prevalent. And so um, I would not be surprised at all, even if we expect our antibodies to last for a two year period, it may become an annual event. And we also, and if you all recall from the previous um, presentation I gave you in December, you know, coronaviruses are not new. Uh, we are concerned about the particular ones that are causing all and wreaking all of the, the physical ha uh, havoc in the body right now. And so, um, you know, there have been coronaviruses that you probably have come into contact with that caused a common cold. And, and it wasn't the rhinovirus that caused it, it was a coronavirus uh, or the flu. So I, I can't tell you that, yeah, we're going to tell everybody you have to get an annual coronavirus or COVID-19 vaccine. I think it will depend on what's happening and, and whether or not we have a particularly dangerous uh, strain of that virus uh, getting out into the community. Okay. Uh, continuing along, uh, a next question just in the queue is, uh, are the pro is the protein in the vaccines very different uh, when you look at, at the two. So is there something that makes one stand out over the other? Uh, not at all. And, and, and uh, here's, a, here's a quick uh, bi kind of um, um, biology and cellular molecular lesson for all of us uh, to, to kind of be aware of. Um, these current vaccines, uh, the messenger RNA, are, they're not what we would consider to be true protein um, protein vaccine. So I understand the spirit of the question, but what you're asking is very, very, very important. So um, uh, is that Milan, Melissa Milan that asked that question? Uh, very, very good question. Um, we, uh, we, there, there are going to be three types of, of um, vaccines on the market, probably I would imagine by no later than um, uh, late spring or early summer. One is the messenger RNA. It has a particular role of what it does in our body. The next one to come out is going to be what we call an adenovector, where they, they take a little bit of the picture, then you can choose the file. Yep. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Or you can do whatever. You can have please, a new Please mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the next one is going to be an adenovector, which kind of takes a very similar approach, and they kind of embed a little bit of the, uh, the messenger RNA that matches up to the coronavirus, and they embed that into a, a, a protein shell, and then they inject that. And then a third one is actually going to be harvested protein, okay, uh, where they have kind of taken it, and in, in a Petri dish, they have grown uh, the actual spike proteins uh, through a very similar um, DNA or, or messenger RNA um, thing, but now they, they take that and that is getting injected. So we're going to have three types. So you kind of got ahead of us, um, Milan, uh, Ms. Milan. You are you are uh, you get you get the first gold star of the day because we are going to have an actual protein yes. vaccine coming on the market probably uh, late spring or early summer. But right now there is literally no difference between the two that are currently uh, available. Great question. Great awesome question. technology. Yes. yes. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ms. McMillan asks a good question, and I know it's on everyone's heart and mind as we go through it. Once you've taken the second dose, do you suggest that it's okay to discontinue wearing your mask? 
and adhering uh, to social distancing. Not, 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 not at all. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm weeks out from having had my second dose and I keep, and I wear my mask everywhere. Okay. And, and, um, and let me tell you exactly why. Uh, why although we are gathering um, pretty good evidence right now, even after you have gotten uh, vaccinated and you have your antibodies and you yourself are protected, if you were to walk into, let's say, a restaurant and there was some of the uh, virus in the atmosphere, okay, that is, is, it's been aerosolized and it's in the air, um, you are going to inhale that as well. We can, okay, so you, you, will, you will continue to be potentially bombarded mm -hmm. by the virus. And what we cannot tell you is that if you turn around and, and you have that in your nostrils and in your mouth, if you turn around and went to another location and you began talking to people or singing or doing whatever, that you would not be, uh, that you would be incapable of expelling that virus before your body has a chance to kill it, okay? So while you may not become ill, we have not fully determined whether or not you can transmit the virus to other people. Now, I think we're getting pretty good evidence indicating that the first two vaccines are probably going to stop that transmission. Uh, but until we have very good definitive evidence, we don't want to continue to promulgate the spread of the virus to other people unknowingly. So um, that's a very good question. And the recommendation is going to be to continue uh, to wear a mask until we, we, we get evidence that it's not a danger anymore. Great question. It's, yeah. Uh, the, here's another uh, another one, and th th there's two that kind of fall together here a little bit. They're similar. Uh, one is the first one from Ms. Tucker, and she said she's read reports on the vaccine causing Bell's palsy in some cases. If a person has had Bell's palsy before, are they more likely to get it again after the vaccine? And similarly, uh, Barbara Maselli asks, are there spe specific types of allergies that should be hesitant to take the virus, like cold uh, urticaria. Urticaria, er, cold yeah. uh, urticaria. urticaria. Yeah. So uh, number one, around about the Bell's palsy. Let me let me be very clear about that. Um, I I had the opportunity. Uh, I got my hands on the the FDA submission for both companies before the FDA reported it publicly, and I read through the uh, there are fifty three page reports and it's very dense reading. And I read and I got to the very end and I began reading about the Bell's palsy on both of them. And it, 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 it grew a concern until I looked at the actual number of people, number one, and then number two, when I combined the two, we're talking about seven people among no, um, 75,000 people. Uh, the, and, um, and it did not appear that that occurred at a greater prevalence than what would naturally occur out in the, out in the population. And so uh, it could not be determined during either clinical trial that the Bell's palsy was being caused because of the vaccine. Because as I had told very, uh, very many people, and I know the dentists are probably upset with me for, for even saying, using it as an example, but there are people that may go get a root canal or get other dental components um, that may actually get Bell's palsy from having gone to the dentist. Uh, sometimes we don't know why people get it. You know, other people get it because they have a lot of stress. And Bell's palsy really is about uh, the nerves. And we have right here on our chin, we have these little holes and nerves come out uh, here, here, and then above the eyes. So when you go to your doctor and they're tapping on these areas, they're trying to figure out, do you have any sensitivity in the nerves that are coming out of the, the skull portion of your brain, um, uh, of your head? And... And uh, sometimes if they get infected with anything and if they can't get the nerve innovation coming through, then yes, you can get that facial droop. So we can't determine right now whether or not the vaccine was literally the cause of it. Now, there may be individuals out there and once you put anything out into the general public and you, you get a population of millions of people, I can't tell you that it did not cause it either. Um, but the, the great thing about it out of the eight people that were reported, and, and finally, they, 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 they talked about seven of the eight, and I'll talk about the one in a moment. Of these seven people that got the Bell's palsy, all of them resolved, um, had complete resolution of their symptoms. And then the eighth one, uh, they didn't report on that one because um, they just had not 
um, had complete resolution before the information gets submitted to the FDA. So there's a great possibility that all of them completely resolve, but right now we cannot make a, a definitive determination that it was caused by the vaccine, but we cannot make a definitive term, determination that it wasn't. My general belief right now is that um, uh, there might be the, the very smallest of possibilities, but it's certainly not widespread. And even in our country right now, uh, we've had 17 million people vaccinated. And at this current moment, I have not heard of any reports of any Bell's palsy that has resulted, but it did show up and they did report it in the clinical trial. Now for as far as the urticaria and other allergies, again, right now, uh, we're gonna recommend people get the vaccine and I'll tell you why. Uh, and the very last thing I, I made in my closing comment last evening, there's nothing about any of the vaccines coming out right now that is more dangerous than if you came into contact with the actual virus. Okay, we have to be very clear about that. Uh, there's nothing about the vaccines that is more dangerous than the actual virus itself. And so if you were to be insulted by the actual, by the actual wild type virus or even one of the variants, uh, if you were to receive insult from that, meaning it has, you, it has come into you, it's in your nostrils, it's beginning to replicate in your body, that could trigger the very same thing that these vaccines could. Because right now, uh, especially with Moderna and Pfizer, there is no preservative in the vaccine that could trigger any of this from happening. And so for uh, even the small number of people who have had um, allergic reactions, uh, anaphylactoid, anaphylactic reactions, these are people that if they were stung by a bee or if they went to a picnic and, and were bitten by red ants, they themselves would probably have a very similar reaction, which is why we give many people the <laughs> EpiPen to, to um, have that. And many, many of the people actually had the EpiPen on them. And so right now, worldwide, I think we've had about 12 cases overall uh, of uh, anaphylactic reaction, but many of those people already had an EpiPen with them when it occurred. So I think those are great questions, um, but the fear of the Bell's palsy, uh, I would not let that stop you from getting it because um, it's not gonna stop you from going to the dentist. Awesome, along the same theme, uh, there's the discussion. Again, it's that sort of theme of Fear, I think. Uh, can you talk about herd immunity from uh, Ms. Gina Montijo? There is a lot of chatter about people saying they won't take the vaccine and are waiting for herd immunity. Yeah, yeah. You know, let me let me let me explain that. And this is very uh, short-sighted on the part of those individuals. Now, herd immunity, uh, and we'll just say if ten of us, ten of us right now, they were on the call. If we were all in the room, and eight of the ten uh, received the vaccine and we were all hanging out with them, theoretically, the other two people uh, would not be capable of getting it from us because we are protected. And so when you hear about 70 or 80% of the population needing to have uh, uh, be vaccinated or have antibodies uh, from a herd immunity standpoint, that's what we're talking about. Now, let me tell you the danger, and, and um, that's why I'm, I'm clearly not in favor of what, what apparently may have been occurring with some of our elected officials or people that were running the the, um, uh, the COVID task force and just letting the, the the virus run rampant and then everybody becoming infected and then getting herd immunity that way. By doing that, you now allow the possibility for the, uh, for the virus to mutate. And so for people who are holding out saying, well, the rest of you go get it and then I'll be protected, that's not what is going to happen. What is more likely to happen is that um, the virus is still going to be there and the pressure of the virus is going to fall into the people who are unprotected. And those unprotected groups, and that's why I'm really concerned about, and that's why we're having the conversation, I'm really concerned about the African American community for people saying, I'm, I'm not going to get the vaccine. Uh, anyone in the, the Latin community. And it doesn't really matter. You can define the demographic group. If there were a group of seniors somewhere that said, no, I'm not gonna get it. Any defined group now will take on and shoulder the burden of receiving the vaccine because it's still gonna look for people who are unprotected. And it offers an opportunity for continued mutation to occur. And so the whole notion, that's why we need to get as many people vaccinated as we can. We need to shut this down from transmitting. We need people to continue to wear the mask. We don't want this to mutate any more than it's going to do naturally. And so the, the notion of herd immunity, 
uh, the, the best definition would be 80% of the people that have uh, antibodies and can no longer transmit. But the other 20%, they may get a little bit of protection from that. But to be perfectly honest, they are probably going to shoulder the burden of the, re of the virus looking and continuing to look for more people to infect. Glenn, did yeah. I answer that question adequately, sir? I, th I think you did. I think I think you nailed it, and it st stimulated something else as I was thinking in a, about it as before we move on, because I have heard of this happening with some of our elder population. Uh, what happens to people who won't take that second dose? Uh, is this going to muck up the works, or it uh, it, 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 it very well could, um, and I'll tell you why. Because um, after the first dose. Um, uh, you've only gotten about 50% 50, 50 of the, of the uh, immune response that we intend to get. And during that time period, uh, you can still become infected, to be, um, to be quite blunt and quite honest. Uh, and so, um, and if that were to occur, that's why, again, I'm not in favor of giving one and then waiting, you know, three, four, nine months later to get the second one whenever you can. Uh, because during that time period, if the virus has an opportunity to infect you, it will. And if we get enough of that occurring, uh, it can actually build up that, that mutation rate and, and potential resistance in those people. And so, you know, that's being uh, hotly contested and debated in the scientific community all around the world right now. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. I think I'm, I'm in favor, I'm in the camp that you need a second uh, vaccine. That's where we see the very robust response. That's why when uh, the slide I was showing you, when the majority of people have a little bit more uh, fever, a little bit more uh, headache and fatigue with the second vaccine because your body is now, it's now working in overtime trying to build up those antibodies and that's what you're feeling. And that will only last for about a 24 hour period. So uh, yeah, so great, yeah, great point and great question. Okay, but I'll continue on, thanks. Uh, to that end also, uh, Ms. Milan also asked again, do you have any idea, and I know it's, it's tough given what you said earlier, but how soon can the general public, the rest of us, be able to get access to the vaccine? Yeah, you know, that's a terrible question to ask right now because um, you know, we're, we're finally getting reports of the, of the amount of vaccine that's been produced and promised. And, and, and if I had to be perfectly honest, my best guess right now is that by the, uh, it's probably going to be early summer. Uh, before we even approach getting to that point. Um, the federal government, they, they purchased enough to vaccinate uh, 50 million people from Moderna, uh, 50 million people from Pfizer. So that's 100 million people. Uh, there's another 100, I got it written down somewhere here. Now there's another um, 100 million people that, that are gonna come from the Johnson & Johnson um, product when they come out probably in a couple of weeks, but it all won't come at one time. Uh, it's still going to continue to roll out. Pfizer is you know, still continuing to push more doses out. And so um, uh, if I had to really guess right now, probably uh, late spring, early summer before everybody in, in, all, in all categories will be eligible to get it. And I saw another question here about, uh, am I to understand that no one is to be denied if they want the vaccine, but the focus is for 65 and above? Um, here in the state of Florida, uh, they, they very well can be denied unless they have uh, physician's orders that are indicating uh, chronic disease conditions. So right now, a 23-year-old or, you know, my 21-year-old son, he's not going to walk in and say, give it to me and you can't deny me uh, because you actually have to put that information into a database and, and it has to be recorded and calculated and, and, um, and they're paying very close attention to that. And the people administering it are pretty much telling the federal government and the state of Florida from a Department of Health standpoint that we are going to follow your rules and guidance on who can get the vaccine. So there is great potential that, that my 21 year old son would get denied um, even though he may want it unless he happened to be diabetic or had high blood pressure or some other uh, condition according to uh, CDC guidelines. Thank you. Uh, going back a little bit related to the sort of side effects and who can take things and not take things. There are a couple here also. One is uh, from Jordan Spriggs. Uh, and the question is, is it re recommended for cancer patients to get the vaccine, especially going those 
uh, those going through chemo and similarly what about pregnant women and kids under 16 yeah you know the, the, uh, right now the pregnancy issue that's a very that's a that's a very touch and go issue right now um, I've had the opportunity and uh, dr. Hill and I were actually with a um, an OBGYN from Sarasota uh, the clinical trials did not focus or allow pregnant women known pregnant women to get into the trials uh, but there were a number of women that did become pregnant during the clinical trials. And they began following and monitoring them very closely. And there appears at this current time to not be any evidence that there was any uh, challenge with either the mother or the developing child. Um, I still don't know if there's going to be a recommendation to, to uh, give it to pregnant women at this current time. And there's still a recommendation also for, for breastfeeding women to avoid it as well. Uh, so those are some of the recommendations. Um, now, for, for people less than 16 years of age, uh, again, uh, I, I spent a lot of time sharing this last evening. The current companies right now, they are, they are doing ongoing clinical trials right now. And so what they've done, they're going back in, in three-year increments. So from 18 down to 15, they're doing clinical trials, and from uh, 15 down to even 12 years of age. And those clinical trials are ongoing. They're trying to enroll people. And if they get enough evidence quickly enough, if enough 12-year-olds and 15-year-olds get into those clinical studies, uh, there could be the offhand possibility that they get FDA approval for children down to the age of 12 um, before or at least during the, the, the school year that will come up in the fall of this year. Uh, but as of right now, there is no recommend. You can only get the Pfizer product at down to age um, 16 and the Moderna product cannot be given to anyone below the age of 18 at the current moment. Well, so listen, uh, Mr. That Brown. was the chemotherapy, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah Mr. Brown, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to take probably one more question because um, I'm gonna have to go and get onto another presentation like this one, but uh, I think Dr. Hill may be able to take over uh, as, awesome. as much as possible, but uh, the chemotherapy, uh, there again, um, that's going to be a direct conversation with the with the um, with your oncologist, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, there are a lot of different types of cancers. There are a lot of, a lot of different types of um, of uh, treatments for cancer. Uh, there are a lot of opinions when it comes to oncologists. Uh, you know, if you get five oncologists in a room and ask them a question about something, you're going to get three different responses, and the other two are probably going to be silent to see which way the other three go. And so, so um, uh, that's going to be, a, you know, depending on the type of cancer, more often than not, they may, you know, they may be very encouraging and tell you, absolutely, we want you to get it. Because if you get infected with the actual virus, with the inflammatory proteins and everything else going on, you may be at particular risk. And I, I will share with you, for people who have uh, certain types of cancers, they are much more prone to develop clotting because of the cancer. And now we're talking about a particular virus with COVID-19 that can actually um, uh, promote clotting as well. So we don't want to trigger uh, unnecessary clotting in a systemic fashion throughout the body because of the virus. And so I know many oncologists uh, have told, told their, um, their patients, yeah, we want you to get it. I had a patient come and tell me that. But on the flip side of that, um, uh, that's going to have to be a direct conversation because there are a lot of different type of cancers and a lot of different type of treatments and and that's going to be tailored with a discussion with your oncologist. So Dr. Sneed, um, I think what we could probably do because of the number of questions, we could respond uh, later in that we have everyone's contact information because like you, I have another commitment at 12. So unfortunately, I, I wouldn't be able to address you know, all of them and wouldn't want anyone to feel slighted. But I do think that Reach Up could assist us in making sure we had everyone's contact information. And Absolutely. we could respond, uh, respond accordingly. And one of the things that we have been working on uh, for the group's benefit is trying to compile a lot of the collective questions that we've been getting with uh, the number of workshops that we've had. And we hope to have something real soon that we could share with everyone um, because we're just so excited that everyone is inquisitive. Um, and concerned and engaged and, and um, you know, really fired up. And so we do value your questions. We value you participating and we do want to continue to be a resource. So um, why don't we try that as a plan and we could work with Mr. Brown as well and, and um, try to make sure that we uh, answer, answer them at a later point since we can't address it today. 
But let Excellent. me you know, let me let me just follow up, Mr. Brown and, and, and Dr. Austin, Dr. Hill. Um, uh, as a closing statement, I just want to thank all of you for for coming in with the questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, again, uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to say I'm Dr. Fauci or or Dr. Uh, uh, Kizmikia Corbett and people like that, but uh, I'm very knowledgeable. Um, I read a lot. Uh, have a very good background in, in the, the cellular process of what's going on. And we want to get as much credible information out to you all so you can make an informed decision, even not only for you, but for the people you work with and people in your own families. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you all for taking the time um, and as much time as we can um, uh, come back and, and, and talk with this group again. I'm very happy to do it. If anything changes in the news and you have concerns, I'm very happy to do it. Uh, we're at a critical point right now in this country. and, and um, and we need to, number one, continue to protect ourselves with, uh, with that mask. Uh, we need to continue to do all of the, the public health measures, uh, but we also really need to try, the only way we're gonna climb out of where we are right now is really to try and get as many people vaccinated um, as possible. And so I just wanna thank you all again, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and it's really uh, humbling and honor, and I'm honored to be able to share information with you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Sneed. And I, I know uh, I speak for my colleagues here. We feel the same way that you take the time and, and, and put yourself out there for us. So thank you for your commitment to the community. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Brown. I'll take my leave now, but thank you all so much. And, and again, um, we are so excited and I, I just wanna tell everyone, go ahead and please put whatever remaining questions that you haven't asked yet, feel free to use the chat to put them in and we'll be able to, to harvest them from there. And we'll do our best to make sure that we get a response back to you in a timely fashion. Um, and we just, again, are just so grateful to have this working relationship with the Children's Board. And um, definitely we have upcoming program that programs that you might be getting invited to. We hope that you'll consider joining us and sharing the word with others uh, as we kind of continue throughout the, the pandemic. But we can emphasize how important it is that right now we do continue to follow the CDC guidelines. And we do hope that today's information was helpful to you. So thank you again and everyone stay safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Hill, and uh, also greatly appreciate your commitment to the community. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat if people want to email me and I can get things uh, to Dr. Hill and, and uh, Dr. Austin, if need be. Um, also, though, I believe you're all registered, so hopefully uh, Dr. Austin can help. Uh, facilitate this as well. So thanks. Thanks, team. Thanks, everyone out there. And I put my email in the chat also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whenever you're ready to go, you can go. I'll just close out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Well, I will talk with the group. <laughs> Mr. Morgan, if you could certainly share the transcript. I will. Like you normally do. Okay. I think that'll help us. And then whatever um, email addresses, because we need to or want to, um, I would imagine, send that survey also. Okay. Kind of as a follow up to this group, but thank you so much. And right. thank you so well, Mr. Mr. Brown, and it just seems like it went by so fast and they That's had so many questions. <laughs> yeah, it did, it did. It's a great group and, uh, and I'm, you know, it's such an important thing. I felt bad we didn't have a couple more minutes left to be able to let uh, Dr. Sneed and you Hello. speak about uh, community and, and anything you might wanna say Yes. about uh, this and, and health disparities in communities. So I, I, I'm sorry, we didn't, we ran out of time. Dr. Austin, you're muted. So I apologize. <laughs> okay, well, I am gonna bid everyone a, a, a goodbye and we will be in touch soon, okay? <laughs> okay, all right, have a good day. Thank you, bye-bye. Goodbye, thank you. All right, take care. Bye guys, be well. Dr. Austin, pleasure. Thank you again. And uh, really appreciate your throwing yeah, this together. I, we lost internet connection here for a minute at reach up. So I got kicked oh. off. Oh my goodness. That's what happened. Wow. wow. Well, uh, we, we've got plenty of questions. So take care gang, be well. All right, take care.